Who is Joseph Campbell and why should we care? A uh, topic that comes up a lot. Joseph Campbell was one of the leading mythology experts of all time. Joseph Campbell is a, a philosopher, a man who, who had this ability to see the truth in a world where we've lost sight of that in many ways. He studied all of these classical myth traditions, and he actually started by studying Native American mythology. He fell in love with it when he was a kid. This was his bliss. And he wound up studying the Aboriginal cultures. He studied Greek mythology. He studied Arthurian legend. He dissected and diagrammed all of our stories. He compared the philosophies, the mythic stories of the whole world. All myths, all movies, all novels, all romances. And he find this one story within all the stories that we can relate to no matter where you come from. He recognized that in spite of all the different stories we seem to be telling, there's really only one. And he called it the hero's journey. There must have been thousands and thousands of hero stories from every culture, but until Joseph Campbell came along, certainly I never realized how they all kind of fit together and how they were basically the same story. I was a religion major in college. I was taking my final exam. And I had a moment where I was just gobsmacked. It's just like, holy crap, it's all the same thing. I mean, it is really all the same thing. The hero's journey is a pattern. You could almost think of it as an algorithm that has three basic parts. Separation, initiation, and return. Separation. You are in one kind of a reality, in one kind of a place, you are separated from it. Initiation. You're put into another place where you are in some manner initiated. Return. You come back. A simple version of the hero's journey is, you know, someone starting out in their normal protected world and then getting a call to adventure. The call to adventure. There's a vision. There's a quest. It's the story of the hero enduring some trials. Various trials and ordeals. Meeting different obstacles along the way. People that hurt you, people that help you. Doors will open, as Campbell would say, for you where there are no doors for others. Dragons will appear that are your dragons alone. You get to like the innermost cave where you're really challenged, like the greatest crisis, and you find your true self. The achievement, the glory, but then that's not the end of it. That is to bring that back to the community. There's a return to tell the story. That is a heroic journey. Separation, initiation, return. All of the adventures of the human story are in there. All the heroes, all the villains, all the gods and goddesses, and all of the knights, and all of the fantastic creatures we can conjure up in animation, they're all in there, because they're all in here. Because they're all in here. This is where they come from. If you look at some of the greatest pieces of literature, the greatest works of philosophy, they all have what Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey. And if you look with a piercing eye, you can recognize his outline in just about any movie or story you would read. Star Wars, The Matrix, Harry Potter, Wizard of Oz. That's a classic story of a hero's journey. You first see Dorothy in her natural environment, and just like out here in regular life, a person is operating in their natural environment every day and living in their house and that kind of thing. And then something happens to shake that world up. And you go on a journey in which you have to face certain tests and challenges. Storytelling is typically about people learning something. You go to a place which is dark and mysterious. You are faced with yourself. There is a relationship between Facing fear and this kind of soul gain. You acquire a quality, a hidden strength, a value. Moments where somebody is tested, somebody moves to a place where it feels like a crisis point, and then they are restored, redeemed, made better through that trial. And we call them heroes. If all of these stories boil down into one map, we can use that map because all human beings are the same, whether they're going through a war like World War II or going through a war inside. It's basically the same kind of process. In other words, we're not separate from the characters we see in our movies and in our novels. They are us. It's one journey. 
we go out and we watch a great hero's journey movie, it's that impulse within us, that seed of potential that wants to be actualized, that's being talked to during those movies and being whispered to, it's time for you to do that. That's the story here. That's what it's all about. There's wonderful narrative iconography for how to live life. The idea that try hard you get, the little engine that could, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I can. This idea that we really can do better, be better, that our greatest selves are still hidden and that the future is the prospect of coming to terms with that self. Dorothy had to confront her inner barriers and so the journey she went on was not just a journey to find out how to deal with the Wicked Witch of the West, it was how to deal with, how to claim her own inner resources. And at the end of the movie, how did she get back home? Well, she clicked her heels together. So she had it all the time, the ability to get back home, but it didn't get mobilized for her until she went through all of those challenges and was able to kind of test herself. It's kind of the ordinary moving into the extraordinary. It's going through the dark to come out to the light. Going from an unsatisfying life to a satisfying life by pushing through the scariest things you could imagine. The most important thing that the myths teach us is to go beyond what we perceive as the limits of our possibility. So mythology needs to be seen for what it is, which is a metaphor for our human existence. It's not a history lesson. It's a metaphor for life and for universal experiences. A lot of people read the myths and they say, well, that refers to something historical, the creation of the world or something like that. But Joe didn't think that. He thought that it's really a narrative about the psyche, what Jung called the self. The problem is that many of us are metaphorically impaired. We don't realize that this thing that they're talking about is actually a metaphor for a transformation process. Just kind of like the Holy Grail, where it's not the thing, it's not the actual concrete grail, it's an intangible thing. But the Holy Grail is a metaphor for that intangible feeling. And so if you look at a book and it says, you will go to heaven, and you don't realize that they're talking about heaven on earth, heaven in our bodies, heaven right now in the now, you might fall into a trance of thinking that you're literally gonna go someplace else if you follow the rules. Having been brought up in a mythical culture, I was very familiar with the different motifs and themes that were encapsulated a mythical being whether it was the Lord Shiva or Ganesh or a goddess, just thinking the name of that person, the whole story was evoked. Carl Jung called these archetypes. Archetypes are primordial, encapsulated stories or mythologies, and they're in the form of a seed in consciousness. When you plant that seed in consciousness, that archetypal seed, that mythical journey, then that seed starts to sprout. And as it sprouts, the patterning forces create the situation, circumstances, events, and relationships for the unfolding of the story. It's better to have a story to look through at life than an explanation. The reason for that is the story is richer. I say select two or three heroes and heroines either in mythology or religion or history, and then ask these mythical beings to incarnate through you. And then don't be surprised when you see situations, circumstances, coincidences, synchronicities, relationships show, suddenly show up that actually are part of the story that you have been seeking to express. Once upon a time in the forest, there was this little tiger cub amongst a flock of sheep and he ate grass, and he wandered around with the sheep. And when he tried to say anything, all that came out was a sort of little meow, not much of a roar. And one day, through the forest, comes a large male tiger. And he's just about to pounce on the sheep, and he sees this tiger cub. He says, what are you doing here? The tiger cub goes, bah. 
picks the tiger cub up by the scruff of the neck and he carries him over to a pond and he puts his face over and he says, look, see that face? You're not a sheep, you're a tiger. The male tiger says, okay, we need to do something. He slays a sheep and he grabs a big hunk of raw meat and he shoves it in the little tiger's mouth. And the little tiger gagged on it is all due on the truth. But it went down. And he got a little bit of energy and pretty soon he had a bigger tiger roar. And eventually he had a full tiger roar and he went off with the male tiger. I think the moral here is self-evident. If you're a tiger living among sheep, you're a pretty poor specimen of a tiger. And we are all tigers living among sheep. We are all individuals with a self that we don't even begin to understand. And unfortunately, if you can open the metaphor out, the food we get from the culture around us is maybe food for sheep. It's not food for tigers. You have to catch at least the spark of what your life is going to be. Or you may spend those dreary decades in corporate America climbing the ladder only to discover it's against the wrong wall. You get to the top, who cares? If this path of the hero's journey is fairly simple in design, why then is it that everybody isn't living it? Well, the answer is that most people on the planet live under a kind of a mass hypnosis. There's a tremendous pressure, even in the media, on really keeping people in their place, in the sense of keeping them happy, tranced out consumers. It's a trance of comfort. It's a trance of not sticking your head up above the crowd very much. That keeps the enterprise going. Most people think it's a luxury and a great privilege to stay home and look at their 800-inch television. If you just space out, you're not developing. We're stimulated by some images and some loud noise. It's about collecting things and stuff and making a lot of money and doing a lot of things. And it's impossible to enjoy that because you end up on that treadmill and you can't get off. And so most people, unfortunately, because they are so victimized by the environment, they have no time to think or be themselves. They become bundles of conditioned reflexes and nerves that are constantly being triggered by people and circumstance into very predictable outcomes and predictable patterns of behavior. There's no creativity. That's the trance, that's the wasteland, where we're just guided toward this weird sense of what's real in our lives. And those ideas that are imposed on us from the outside about what we should and should not do. That you lose contact with this mythical domain, which is actually part of your soul. It's there in everyone. It's their passion, it's their bliss, it's their unique skills, it's their unique ways of expressing themselves, it's their song, which if they sing, they could do anything. If you look at every heroic journey, the hero has been confronted with the fact that the world that they thought was reality was nothing more than illusion. I go back to the Matrix, which is what was the Matrix? It was just this big illusion. It, it, it was the dominant values and beliefs that the world had put around this guy, Neo, the seeker on the hero's journey. And what did he do? He, he felt this longing to go beyond the illusion, to go beyond the matrix. So he took the red pill and he woke up to reality. And what was reality? Reality was he was full of potential. Separation begins with what we call the call to adventure. Campbell tells us there's literally almost a phone ringing. It's like the universe, the divine God, whatever you want to call it, literally dialing you up and ringing and giving you a call, asking you to step out and to live your journey. Something breaks into your quotidian reality and makes it impossible for you to, to continue. Well, you can hang up the phone, you can run away, but it'll keep coming back, it'll keep coming back until you finally answer the call. If you're not paying attention, the wake-up calls come in the form of a sledgehammer. You know, if you're paying attention, they might come in a tickle feather. So we don't always get the call as a choir of angels with trumpets singing to us beautifully one sunny morning. In Star Wars, Luke comes back, his house has been burnt down. He's gotta go. 
Oftentimes it comes in the depth of our despair, in the losing a job, getting fired, getting divorced, having your house foreclosed on. These things that you just would never want to have happen are often the exact things we need to catapult us, to catalyze us into that next version of ourselves. Chinese symbol for crisis are two symbols. The first one is danger. And the second one immediately is opportunity. So crisis is both danger and opportunity. This idea that if one storyline collapses, that that's the end of the movie, is not true of human life and never was true of human life. I know people who have prospered in the most extraordinary way in the worst type of adversity. It's actually revealed something to them about themselves they didn't know, and that became the new journey they took. Let me put this into really practical 100-pound terms, because if the camera had been pointed at me when I was 24 years old, what it would have seen was a person who weighed 320 pounds. You would have seen me puffing on two or three packs of Marlboros a day, a relationship that I didn't want to be in, and I had a job I hated. Everything was wrong in my life. And so those are ripe moments for a wake-up call in life. You know, if you haven't been paying attention enough so that you end up with a job you hate, a relationship you don't want to be in, a body you don't like, and you're addicted to a bunch of things, you're ripe for a sledgehammer blow from the universe. And I got it. You step over a threshold, meaning you move from one world into another. Sometimes you're shoved from one world into the other. Once you make the decisions that Joseph Campbell is talking about, about really hearing the call and being willing to take on the challenges of that new awakened life, once you do that, you begin to feel a power that it's like nothing else I've ever experienced. And I think a lot of us are just plain old afraid of that. The hero's journey for me is having the courage to look within yourself and say, what am I here to do? What am I most passionate about in my life? What are my greatest gifts? How do I give them to the world? If you were to ask me, what's the one thing that keeps people from their mountaintops? What's the one thing that keeps people small rather than allowing them to present their genius to the world? It's their fears, or as Joseph Campbell says, it's their dragons. Fear is anything that gets in you. It's a beast, it's a monster. Fear that is unfaced has a tendency to creep. It moves through your experiences. It starts to toxify your perceptions, you become scared. It's just like a muscle. If you want to get strong or you want to run a triathlon or run a marathon or do whatever you want to do physically, you know you need to train, you need to get stronger, which is exactly the same thing. Think of it like a gym. You've got to consistently go up to your fears and go one step past them, one step past them. And you'll find that your comfort zone expands each time you do that. Things that used to freak you out won't freak you out as much. And now you have the tools, you have the strength literally to lift more in your life as you face your fears more and more authentically. Rather than running away, we should go closer to it because once we can see our fears, the death of the fear becomes certain. Ogre, dragon that hoards. (laughs) All of these stories talk in those terms for several reasons. On the one hand, we could call it projection in a psychological sense. So we project out and we create an antagonist that we have to slay. But what's actually happening is we're dealing with the energies inside ourselves. Society is in fact a reflection of what's inside, that in fact you've sort of chosen your monsters. Of course in Star Wars, which was pretty much entirely based on Campbell's paradigm, Luke Skywalker has to go into the cave where he does battle with Darth Vader, where finally he cuts off Darth Vader's head. And the head rolls to his feet and Darth Vader's helmet opens up, and what does he see but his own face? He thinks that there's evil outside of him. When the struggle between good and evil is understood to be going on inside of us, it can be very beneficial. This is part of a personal transformation, overcoming our negative aspects, emphasizing our good ones. But what often happens, of course, we want to feel that we are good, So we don't find the negative within ourselves, we're gonna find it somewhere out there. There's a circle and the circle needs to be closed and the way to close the circle is to come back, return with something different than you started with and to share that. And that to me is like a perfect hero's journey. That's the ultimate end to the hero's journey. It's not slaying the dragon, it's not beating the bad guy. 
it's giving back the essence of that journey.